the heart of the rainforest, hidden beneath the Rowanzori Mountains, legends tell of a vast and treacherous maze, the Caves of Rowanzori. You and four other adventurers will descend into the depths of the Caves of Rowanzori and attempt to gather the treasures therein and then escape, if you possibly can. The game plays from two to five players, takes about 30 to 45 minutes to play, and is for ages eight and up. And in the game, you're going to be starting off as an adventurer inside the caves, and you're going to get a hand and a deck of tiles. You'll be playing tiles down, either face up or face down, depending on the tile, and moving into locations or trapping your opponents in other locations. Your objective is to escape, like said previously, but in order to do so, you'll need to remove your hand and deck Deck from all tiles, finish the game by playing the last exit tile and moving on to that space before anybody else. But that's the basics of the game, I'll show you what comes inside, and then I'll tell you what I think about the game The Caves of Roranzori. I said that right, I think. Here are the components for The Cave of Roranzori, as well as the rule book, and like previously shown, the box behind me. In the game, you're going to be getting a ton of tiles, start tiles, base deck tiles, dark tiles, and the exit tile, the most important tile in the game, because when your deck is completed, you're going to be playing this down to escape. Additionally, every player is going to get a special character, whether you're the explorer, the naturalist, or a tracker, or these two others, along with a special ability card that you can use once per game. One of them might be something like the pickaxe and medical bag, which can help you in your progress to escape the caves. You're going to start the game by shuffling up all of the tiles after placing these three entrance tiles down and removing these two when playing a three-player game or placing them down based on the number of players, as well as setting, of course, this exit tile aside as well. The rest of them are just going to be shuffled up, dealt four to each player, and then you're going to have equal decks, which means in a three-player game you might have one or two or three dark tiles left out, depending on the number of extra tiles they may include in the campaign. Regardless though, you're also going to be getting an icon key, which is both front and back for how to play your turn. And on your turn, it's very, very simple. Each player will start in their own starting space, and the game will be chosen based on the last person who went spelunking, because that makes sense, right? Uh, you're going to start with your cards in hand. There's going to be four of them, and the cards, uh, cards or tiles, I should say, are going to have different effects on them. Some of them might be dark tiles, like this one here, in which case it's going to require you a save tile to escape it, or if you don't have it, you'll suffer some kind of penalty. When you play on your turn, you're going to get three choices of actions and you will take one of them. The first one is you can move. When you move, you will go from one space to any other that you can possibly move to until you reach a space that has a way to get through. So for instance, in this case, in this scenario, I couldn't go to here, but I would go to here. But if these two were going somewhere else, so there's tiles on these sides here, then I in fact could move over to here. That is how you move. It's very, very simple, basically. If you can, if you're just trying to get to another space in which you can then move because certain places will be blocked off as the game goes on. The next thing you can choose to do is you can choose to explore a tile that is face down, like one of these guys here, or you can place a tile that is face up and move into that tile. So we'll start with the blue player and we'll do this simple basic action. We're going to go ahead and take one of these tiles here and we'll place it down on the track and then that character will move into that tile. The last action you can choose to do is placing dark tiles down. When you place a dark tile down, you're simply going to place it on one of your opponents adjacent to one of them in any area that they possibly, you possibly can play it, and then allow them to walk into it at some point, hopefully. You can never place the tile next to you or adjacent to you in any way because these are going to supposed to be affecting your opponents, and there's a save on the back of it. So in this case here, this requires a green save card to stop from the player suffering this penalty. If they have the save tile, they can move past it and move on to the save tile they placed. If not, they'll suffer the penalty, which in most cases is going to be they lose their turn and they are blocked. But in other cases, the other things can potentially happen as well. And you can see the penalties on the bottom left here on your little player reference code. 
So I went ahead and moved here. I placed and moved. That's my first action. I'm going to go ahead and draw up to four. And then I'm going to move to the next player, which is green here. And he has actions of his own choice as well. Additionally, there are some unique things, like this here is a torch. Torches will let you light up dark tiles, which can forego you having to deal with the saves and or penalties, depending on the tile. But you can also use them as a regular tile by simply placing it down and moving your character in. Or there's just additional tiles here which have a lot of extra entrances and exits as well as saves. Now saves can be used to ignore dark tiles and they can also be used to simply move on. Drawing a card here and then moving to the next player. And this player here will once again decide what they want to do. They don't have any dark tiles. They have two saves, a blue and one of these pink ones here. Oh, and they have this one as well which is a white. And then they have this torch here where they don't really need this. They should save this. And remember having a good assortment of different saves is useful, especially when you go throughout the game and you find dark tiles. And this player can continue along the path of the green player or maybe choose their own route and simply move over here. And once again, they draw a card. And that's the basics of the game. There are different types of dark tiles. Some of them are going to be nothing and there's no problem. You can just simply go on them. They're kind of like a bluff. Others may be something like this one here which is a chasm, and if you have a green tile, which I'll go ahead and just show you. So the blue player, let's say that this was here, and it's the blue player's turn. Uh, as an action, they can choose to either move, which they'll be able to move here, or they can choose to interact with this dark tile. Now he's got a blue save in his hand, so he's gonna go ahead and try and see if he can get through that. Well, this requires a green, he doesn't have that, he suffers the penalty, he looks in the bar here that tells him what the penalty is, and usually for the most part, it means he's not going to be able to take his turn, in which case we'll go to the next player's turn, and play continues just like that. That's basically how dark tiles work. There's also some other tiles in there called flooded tiles, which function very similarly to water tiles, which you place them on your opponent's side as opposed to yours. And the reason why that is, is because if you place a dark tile next to you, and you have that specific save, you can just simply utilize that to your advantage and place a save tile in front, and that's not what they're looking for you to do. Regardless though, that's the basic idea of the game. The only thing I didn't really explain to you, I suppose, is that each player has their own unique special ability, like this one here, says that all hands pass to the left when you use it, which is usable once per game, as well as their own unique item and or weapon, and they have unique abilities to choose from as well. Maybe they're gonna be med packs, or you'll be able to break certain through certain things, and of course you'll run into things that are unique in the game as well which i didn't talk about too much like tnt or the ability to take more actions with more tiles which can come in handy as well which we'll discuss during my review of the game but i think you get the idea once you run out of your hand and your deck your last action is going to be hopefully to place this tile down which is the exit move on to the space and claim victory for the caves of roranzori well done you exited the game caveats for the game and i have one which is when you place a dark tile, you have to obviously place it on an adjacent space next to an opponent. And additionally, you cannot place a dark tile adjacent to another dark tile. That's mean, and you can't do that. <laughs> but otherwise, let's talk about a couple of the tiles I didn't really specify all that much information about. One of them being a plus one or a plus two. When you lay down a tile with a plus, you'll be able to lay down another tile. And if you lay down a tile with a plus two, you can lay down two more tiles, which is useful because you're trying to get rid of the cards in your deck. There's TNT as well. Let's say you've got a dark space and you do not want to see what that is because it's probably gonna be dangerous. I don't know, pretend this is a dark space. And so you're gonna use your TNT. You're going to place your TNT tile over that tile. And then you'll get a bonus plus one action, which will let you play another tile adjacent to that and move into it. So it's basically a plus one with a bonus of ignoring a dark tile, which is very nice. And the last one, which you did talk about, was torches. Torches let you light up certain areas, which are beneficial to you for the most part and allow you to see those dark spaces before walking into them and suffering a penalty. The penalties are as follows. You're blocked, you miss a turn, dead end if you lack the correct symbol, and you're blocked and must take one dark tile, non-dark tile from the player who laid this tile which is very good to get on your opponents because if they don't have what they need in order to successfully uh, get across, you get to give them a card or a tile from your hand, which will then make it less difficult for you to exit. You're trying to basically in this game, remove all those tiles as fast as possible. And the game in general lets you play one at a time. You play one, I play one, which makes it a completely balanced system up until 
you start seeing TNTs pop up, or plus ones, or plus twos, or dark tiles that block you because you're not actually able to go across because you don't have a save. But wait, you do have a save, so now you can move over that tile and onto the tile that you played, which gives you a sense of avoiding difficult traps and dangers along inside the caves. This game kind of reminds me of the game Subterra. It's not really the same, it's definitely different in nature. Subterra is more, I guess, is a little more strategic than this game. This game is more based on luck because you are hopefully gonna have what you need in your hand. But the strategy in this one comes to what tiles you save and how you choose to use them at what point in time in the game. The quality of the components are very nice. This is a really well done prototype. The artwork in the game is fantabulous. It feels like I'm entering a cave. The theme does its due diligence in making you feel like you are going through the caves. I played this with my cousins. I played this with my group of gamer friends and pretty much everybody liked it. One said that it was too much luck for them, but my cousins on the other hand were really into it. It was one of those games that was really easy to learn, really easy to teach and easy to play with the ability to make strategic decisions and allow you to course correct as the game goes on. When you get down to the very end there where you're starting to place down those tiles and there's those last three, you start feeling the tension build and you need to get to that exit before anybody else and you're thinking you've got the case, you've got, you've got it all set until your opponent drops a plus two and then a plus two and chain combos with a dynamite and things can get crazy out of hand real quick, which is how the game functions, which is a positive or a negative depending on how you like to play your games. Either way though, this is a tile placement game in which you're trying to place all your tiles down before your opponents with the basic aspect of playing one tile a turn until something unique happens in the game. If you like that style of game, I strongly suggest you take a look at Caves of Roar and Zori. I had a good time with this one. This one's a bit crazy and who knows what's gonna happen. The combos get busted out and sometimes it's a positive feeling for me and sometimes I'm like, hey, why are you doing that? <laughs> Which I suppose is just all part of the fun for this specific type of game. Regardless of if you're interested, take a look down below, link in the description to go ahead and pick up the Caves of Roar and Zori, a competitive tile placement game to rush to the finish line before your opponents because, I don't know, the caves crumble upon them as you escape. Just like bad guys, they don't look at, or, you know, cool guys don't look at explosions, that this, the caves crumble as you leave, and everybody else is like, no! You, you get the point. All right. Thanks for watching. As always, I look forward to exiting the caves of Roar and Zori with you. Well, not with you. I'm gonna exit, you're gonna stay behind, the cave's gonna crumble and you're all gonna die, but I will live and tell the story like I have in this video. Next time!